G'day and welcome back to the channel. On this episode, we're gonna start the disassembly of the 950cc engine to go in the Morris Minor. So welcome back everyone to another episode of Tomo's Tune-Ups. This episode we are going to start stripping the 950cc engine that we decided to go ahead with and get for the Morris Miner. Now we decided to go with this for a couple of reasons. One, parts availability are second to none. They're just as common if not as common as a classic Mini or Moke and Quite frankly, we can get way more power out of this than what we can, the old flathead side valve engine. So essentially what we're gonna be doing is stripping this completely down, we're gonna take everything apart, we're gonna label everything, put it in a box, we're gonna send it over to the guys at Sprite Parts and they're gonna help us out with all the parts and accessories, everything we need to be able to get this thing machined and ready to rebuild. So let's start the disassembly process. So like I said, we're gonna start stripping this apart and we're gonna put everything inside a box, we're gonna get everything cleaned up, machined, anything that can't be machined, we're gonna get probably acid dipped and probably even uh, powder coated as well, depending on the style of setup we're gonna go with. Now, I haven't decided what color we're gonna paint this engine, but it's probably gonna be a British racing green or an olive green. So I do apologize if you can hear the fan going in the background. Once again, it has been another scorcher of a day here down under. So you just wanna make sure that you keep nice and cool, especially in the things that you're doing. All right, I also have some Ziploc bags as well and a Sharpie. So we just wanna be opening that up and we're gonna be grabbing a bag out and just labeling everything that we're putting in there. Now, when you're doing this sort of stuff, you don't need to bag everything, but it is definitely a worthwhile investment just to make sure that anything you take off, you know where everything goes, especially if they are different bolts and sizes. All right, so we're just removing the rocker shaft next. With these, you're gonna need a couple of deep sockets just to be able to release the longer bolts on the top. Now, these will generally come off with the rocker stud. If not, it'll just be the nut that comes off. So make sure you grab the washer as well that goes with it. Now, on the second rocker itself, it has a little assembly, which has like a little cutout in it, which is a locator and prevents the rocker shafts rotating, I believe. So you gotta make sure that that only goes one particular way. It is quite tempting to grab a rattle gun and just send it with all the nuts and bolts all around the outside to get the head studs off, but Thomas Tech Tip, don't use a rattle gun, use a ratchet and undo it in the same order in which you would normally do it up in. All right, so now they're all loose, we can then work Removing all of the head studs and or nuts. What I generally like to do is just use a rattle gun just to help speed up the process a little bit. But also make sure that the nut comes out of the end of the socket. So just wind it back on just to help remove it a bit easier. Now I'm actually considering changing all of these nuts and studs to um, ARP bolts. So I think it would be worthwhile doing and it really just help uh, the overall aesthetics of the engine but also the extra power that we're going to be making not that we're going to be doing some land speed records in this thing but it'll be worthwhile just to do something different as well as enable some longevity for it as well now arp bolts aren't a necessity when doing a rebuild like this but I haven't used them before and I wouldn't mind trialing it. So I kind of think the amount of quality that this customer is asking for and that I need to produce for him, I think it really asks for it. So I don't see why not. It'd be also worthwhile having a look to see what rockers are fitted to this. If they're a high lift rocker arm or if it's uh, just a standard one, they do look quite large for what it is. So I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to do some research into it and find out because that's another upgrade we can do as well. Put some high lift rockers in there. Now, we have spoken about rockers before and it'd be worthwhile noting uh, which ones we go with, whether it be the 1.3 or the 1.5 to one. So let's have a look into that down the track and see what we can come up with. All right, so we got all the head studs, uh, well, some of the studs out and I got some of the nuts off as well. So what we're gonna do next is just remove the thermostat. We're gonna remove the 
um, bypass hose. We'll probably end up just blocking this off because it doesn't actually have a heater inside the car, so we don't need it. Uh, we'll take out the spike plugs as well, um, get the thermostat out of there, and then we should be able to remove the cylinder head. All right, so remove the thermostat. Now, thermostats play a vital component in the cooling system. Essentially what it does is it enables the engine to get operating temperature as quick as possible. So you need to make sure that you get the right one to suit your vehicle. So depending what sort of climate you live in, you may want to go hotter or colder depending on whereabouts you live in the world. Just get rid of all these. Those will go straight in my bin. Now it is worthwhile noting that if you are going to be storing an engine for a lengthy amount of time, fill in any of the holes, cover the engine as much as you possibly can, so don't you let any uh, debris, water, rust, anything get in. The reason for that is uh, my mate Cole from Classic Mini DIY did a video uh, and he stripped, I think it was an old 850 engine down, you'd have to double check the link above. Uh, and yeah, the thing was just full of dirt and cobwebs and everything because it had just been exposed to the atmosphere. And I think he was able to save it, which was really good. But yeah, it is worthwhile noting that if you are gonna be storing an engine for a lengthy amount of time, cover it up as much as possible. All right, so, yeah. By the look of that, oh man, we are definitely, definitely gonna whew, need a new one of those. So I'm not sure if these are available new or if you can only buy second hand. So it'd be worthwhile looking into that. Let's just have a look at this thermostat as well. Oh, if we can get it out. It is a, generally a thermostat will have it written on the bottom. Yes, that's a 74 degree, you probably can't see because of the lights so bright. But generally it'll be stamped somewhere uh, on there as to what temperature it's at. So if you're ever unsure, you can always put it in some boiling water, get a thermometer and just check and make sure that it not only opens, uh, but the temperature in which it opens as well. All right, next one's just gonna be the water outlet. Now this is designed for cars with heaters. So it's always good to have, especially if you live in colder climates. In Australia, it's not really necessary. I run one in my classic mini just to enable not only a little bit of extra cooling and heat dispersion when it is a really hot day, but also to help heat up the car. Now it is worth noting that when you do use a heater tap um, or even just an elbow like this, when you're trying to heat up a space, the bigger the heater, the more efficient it's gonna be. When you own a classic mini or even a Moke, probably Mokes don't even have heaters and I'd love to know in the comment section below if they do, that the size of it in my mini is like the size of a thick cut piece of toast from a cafe. So it's not really that big, essentially, it's gonna take the chill off the air, but it's not gonna heat up the air around us all that much. But I use it generally for heat dispersion, but also to enable the cabin to be heated up on the cooler days. All right, so next thing is the rocker shaft assembly. So like I said, we'll probably end up upgrading that depending on what it came out with standard. We'll ask Colin from Sprite Parts and see what he reckons, but I definitely think we can get some more power out of that by upgrading it. All right, we'll take the push rods out while we're here. Now, we'll probably end up getting new ones, so long as they're all okay and they're not bent, but we'll see how we go. You should really keep these in order, but you know what, I'm not overly fast. If any of them are bent, we can just replace them. All right, we'll take out the spike plugs next, put those straight in the bin because, to be quite frank, we don't exactly need them. Now remember spark plugs tell a story as well, so it's always interesting to pull them out and have a look. So number four was quite sooty, number three was sooty but also a bit rusty, number two was all right, and number one was fairly lean, so got some sort of combustion issue going on here, or it's just been exposed to the elements straight in the bin. Now we do also need to take the valves out of there, so we need to pull those apart one at a time, but we can do that once we get everything apart. All right, wiggle the head up. Hmm, fair amount of oil, but it's a little normal, I guess. Now by normal, I don't mean that there should be an abundance of oil around here. Um, I mean that when you lift it up, generally oil is gonna spill everywhere. Now we do also need to take these um, head studs out as well. So we'll get a rag, we'll clean that all down. We'll get a couple of nuts, remove all the head studs, and then continue on with the process. <laughs> All 
All right, so the next thing is gonna be the push rod covers at the back of the engine. And there is two different ones. So one has a little spout coming out of it, which obviously goes to absolutely nothing. The other one doesn't. So it's worthwhile as well noting which way they go. Now these covers caught me out for a long time and used to leak like absolute sieves uh, because they do need to have a uh, fiber washer on there as well to help seal it. You can buy kits, I think from memory, to help it seal, but it'll really just depend on where you're going, where you're getting them from, but Mini Sport generally has everything. Now we also have the buckets as well, so we'll take those out. So we'll put those in the uh, box with the push rod covers. Alright, so to get these buckets out, you can generally just stick your finger in there, lift it up, and out she comes. You can get upgraded ones of these as well. Some of them have holes in the bottom of them, others don't. Some have them in the side, I believe. You can get lightened ones. For what it's worth, you might as well get the best ones you possibly can and what you can certainly afford. It's all going to help with the performance. It may just add little pieces of um, performance to the vehicle. It may not be noticeable, but all the little pieces that you add to it now are certainly going to help. All right, so part of the process as well is we need to remove any of these bolts. So we're going to remove this one. It looks like there was an oil plug here for something. I'm not entirely sure what that was, but we're going to have to uh, find a plug for that, or at least ask Colin what it is. Uh, and that'll be the blanking plug as well for a mechanical fuel pump. So we're going to run an upgraded uh, electric pump. It'll probably run about three to four PSI, so not a great deal, but we're going to keep that plate, but we need to take that off anyway. So we'll get the bolt out, we'll get this off, and then we'll probably turn the engine around and do the rest of it from the other side. And behind there will be a gasket as well. So it's always imperative to make sure that you replace this gasket. Otherwise, this is going to leak. And on a mini, this thing leaking is going to be a bad time. All right, and that will also have a replaceable copper washer. So make sure you replace that as well when you're doing a rebuild. All right, so we're just going to turn it around. And we should be able to get to the back of the engine fairly easily. Now... Not a great deal we can remove from the back here, other than the dipstick. Uh, we're going to remove the oil pressure relief valve, which is this one here. So behind there is going to be a spring and a bucket, so we need to make sure that we remove those. Uh, it looks like there was probably an oil pipe here uh, that comes out probably for an oil cooler maybe, or an oil line. That'll actually probably go to the... Oh, sorry, that goes down to the oil filter housing, so it'll run from here down to there. Uh, and we also need to remove the distributor locking tab as well. Now, there is an O-ring on the bottom of the shaft, so I'll show you that when we get it out. Uh, but let's work on getting those two off. You'll never believe how much easier it is to do this in a shed with some actual room. It's unbelievable. All right, so that O-ring I was just telling you about, that is down behind here. So they do have two O-rings. One goes on this shaft, which is just here, which is... Uh, <laughs> non-existent pretty much it'll sit just here where my finger is so right up against this edge so there's the large one and the smaller one goes inside here on the actual distributor itself all right so I need the world's biggest spanner to do this mother trucker this i believe is a one inch i'm either gonna get this right or wrong i think it's right yeah i might actually just try and get it with the open end maybe yeah there we go all we've got to really do there is just crack it, and then it should just come out by hand. So like I said, there is a spring behind here, so just be careful that when you undo it, it doesn't go bouncing out. There we go. So the oil pressure relief valve spring. And there should be a bucket in there as well. So we might even be able to just get a magnet on that and just pull it out. There we go. Oh, it's actually got a ball bearing. That'll be the reason why I couldn't just pull it out by hand. Some of them have uh, buckets or followers. The, the other type, as you just saw, has a ball bearing. Now, next thing we need to do, need to remove the distributor shaft. So you can do this a couple of different ways. I'm just gonna use a magnet and then hopefully just pull it straight out. Uh, if not, I think you can use a quarter inch bolt. That's gonna be super difficult because it's kicked sideways. Yeah, that's gonna be an absolute pain now. Because I've actually half dropped it. Anyway, don't do what I did and drop it in there. All right, next thing, I'm just going to remove the Welsh plugs. So, like I showed you before, 
push them all the way in as far as we'll go. And generally we'll just come out. Doesn't look like the previous owner did a very good job of painting the engine very well. We might even be able to get lucky, grab a magnet. I don't know if it's going to work. Probably won't because it's, yeah, it's not steel. Okay, so I was going to say maybe we might be able to get lucky and uh, pull it out uh, with a magnet, but I'd say they're probably brass. Uh, okay, so someone's actually sealed them in as well by the look of it. Shouldn't really need to use elastic on this sort of thing. Just a bit of like aviation sealing or something or equivalent. Should be sufficient enough. Let's see the amount of sealant that's on that thing. Jeez Louise. Whew. All right, so I'm just gonna try a uh, center punch just to see if I can get that little bit more flex out of it to be able to get it to separate. Put a hole in it. Ah, there we go. And we can just wiggle it out. It's, oh, did not expect that to come out. Not that it's gonna lose much because there's probably not a lot of coolant in there, but just to catch it, we'll catch what's left, I guess. Throw it out. So there you go. So you line up. Do the same with the others. Probably find if you drain one, the others probably won't leak out because all the water's drained out of it or coolant. Okay, that'll also come out as well when we flip the engine upside down to do the rest. Um, I think. Okay, so there's no other. Uh, Welsh plugs, core plugs, butt plugs, free plugs over here. I think there might be one under here. I don't actually think so. There could be one just under this plate here, uh, but by the look of it, there's probably only three. There's definitely none on the back side of the engine, so we're all done there. Uh, next thing is going to be uh, rip the timing chain and the water pump off. All right, next thing is going to be the water pump. And before we take it off, I can actually hear that's quite squeaky. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was shagged. Now water pumps come with a water pump kit where you can buy it with the bolts. Certainly advised, simply because over time, bolts stretch, they lose the tension, you can round them off, damage them. It's worthwhile just replacing them as a kit when you replace the water pump. Yeah, it look, doesn't look too bad. There's, yeah, there's a bit of cavitation inside there as well. And you can see bit of crystals forming so that can happen when you mix different coolants um, or even it's just been sitting for a long time which I'd say this probably has but you can also hear the pump is quite noisy you can see the little relief valve at the bottom there that just enables it to leak that if it is going to leak generally it'll leak out of there or if there's another one on there it'll leak from there uh, this doesn't have the bypass either so I want to see if I can maybe get one with a bypass hose just I like the the fact of it, we enable a little bit of extra coolant to circulate through there as well. All right, next is gonna be the front crank pulley. So I actually wanna upgrade that as well, like we have done on pretty much every engine that I've built so far. So I'll put that to the side. Next thing is the timing cover. So we'll just undo all the bolts around the outside here. Now, do take note, uh, there is a mixture of half inch and uh, seven sixteenths uh, that go all around the outside. Also, I do wanna upgrade the timing case cover, so I wanna try and get an MED one just to make it help look the part uh, with all the extra parts that we're gonna be fitting to the engine. Now, just to save there being any oil leak, I'm just gonna grab my drain tin. That way we can catch anything that comes out. All right, so just bending that cover out of the way just so I can get that bottom bolt out. It's not gonna matter too much. Even if we wanted to reuse it, we just bend it back into shape. Um, it would be interesting as well to know um, what this is used for. Is it just a timing mark or a reference that they use from factory? Anyone that knows, it'd be great to, uh, to find out. Now, I'm actually just gonna leave this in one of my containers to drain uh, overnight just to let all the oil and stuff soak out of it. That way when I put it in the box, not that we're probably gonna need it, but yeah, I'll put it in there. Oh, look at that. Look how much timing you're losing from that. Oh, my goodness. All right, so you can actually see someone has had a go at this before. So someone has had this chain off 
uh, at some stage, whether it be just to replace it, whether it be to redo the timing, whether it be upgrade the cam or even just the gears, whatever it may be, someone's definitely had this off before and you can see by the witness marks down around here. You also wanna be looking at the edges of the teeth as well, just see what they're, they're like. If they're nice and pointy, if they're rounded off, if they're missing, things like the teeth being damaged is going to prevent proper drive. So this is one of the reasons why we're gonna step it up to a duplex vernier adjustable chain, because then that will enable us to make sure that we can get 110% out of the chain and timing compared to just a standard single row or even just a double row chain. Now, by the look of this, this whole back piece is just one piece. So what we might need to do, if we're gonna get one from MED, it just depends if we need these side brackets. Uh, and if we can also just maybe trim this off here as well for where the alternator, I would imagine probably bolts onto here, or if we can adapt something to make it work uh, with a MED timing cover. All right, so I've got my striking chisel pry bar. go let's bend that lock tab back grab the rattle gun to the same size as the crank bolt I believe yep so I'm just gonna put those in the same bolt arrangement case as the timing cover as well that timing chain now also you can see here it's a fair amount of end float in the crank, so hopefully just a new set of thrust washers will fix that, because if not, we're gonna need a bloody new crank or a new block, depending how badly it's worn. Okay, so that's off. We probably don't really need that, but I'll just put in the bag anyway that we're gonna take to Colin. Now, gotta make sure we take the keyway out of the crank and the keyway out of the camshaft. Let's see if I can just pry that out just a little bit. I may not be able to, no, won't be able to, that's okay. We'll put the keyway or the Woodruff key in the bag with the timing cover. Okay, and then we'll just get these washers off here as well. I'm sure he will do the end float clearance, especially behind the uh, harmonic balancer as well if this little sucker wants to come out, that is. Oh. So essentially those washers enable the right clearance between the end of the crankshaft and the uh, gear that the timing chains are gonna run on for the crankshaft. Definitely don't lose them, whatever you do. All right, next one's gonna be the three cam bolts that hold the uh, thrust plate in. All right, so unlike on a mini, these are just standard hexagonal bolts usually you have tapered um, allen key bolts that go in here. All right, and we've just got these two bolts here as well to remove. And that rear timing cover should just come straight off. All right, so I'll just grab my dead blow, give it a couple of hits, bang, done, off. Love it when you try to do particular things and it just doesn't go according to plan. Now, we should be able to pull that camshaft. Ugh straight out cool bananas so you can see the uh, spindle drive for the distributor just there now this is a standard camshaft by the look of it doesn't have any markings on it in regards to um, it being upgraded you can see where the cam lobe's actually been running um, on the followers there's no real damage to it we're going to upgrade that to a different style and we need to make sure as well like i've spoken about before you get the right oil pump to suit the right camshaft application all right next part is to flip the engine upside down so i'm just going to put a drain tin on either side just to catch any excess debris that's there and then we can invert the engine pull the sump off uh, take the con rods out and remove the pistons now actually before we do that i'm just going to put it on its end hopefully that coolant will oh Stop dripping in a second. Let's put that bolt back in. I'm just gonna take the flywheel off from this side. I'll just adjust the camera so you can see. All right, so next part, we're just gonna remove the flywheel before we go any further. I'm just using a 916 socket and big bertha right here. Sometimes you find that flywheels only go on and come off in one direction, meaning that the holes are offset. So you do need to find the way in which it goes. 
But you're probably fine in this case, it'll probably only go on in one direction. So we get that machined, make sure she's all Mickey Mouse. So the ring gear looks nice and clean. Oh, it is <laughs> missing a tooth here. So that'll probably have a bit of engagement issue. Yeah, and there's a couple over here that's been grinding away. So we're not probably getting a new flywheel, maybe a lightened flywheel. That way it'll just help with the overall startability of it. Uh, but also with a four cylinder engine, generally you'll have two spots in which the crankshaft will stop and it'll always start. So you'll generally find it'll wear in two particular areas. So generally like around here and around here, so it'll be opposite. The more cylinders you have, generally the more points of contact the starter motor will make contact with. But in a four cylinder, it's quite often in about two spots. So there's some here that's been engaging. There's one tooth here that's missing and there's one over this side as well. So almost completely opposite each other. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is remove all the bolts down around here. So they look like they're all half inch bolts everywhere. Now, it is worthwhile noting that this vehicle does not come standard with a rear main oil seal. All right, so the reason it doesn't have a rear main oil seal is because the rear main end cap, meaning the one closest to the flywheel, uses the cap as a bit of an oil deflector and prevents the oil from coming out. So what happens is as the oil is sloshing around through the engine, if it's gonna get into there, what it's gonna do is it's gonna bounce up, it's gonna ricochet off the flat edge, which then prevents the oil coming in. If it makes it past that flat edge, it then works its way into the end of the crankshaft in which the crankshaft has a anti-directional rotational cutout in it, I guess, which then catches the oil and then spins it back into the engine. So it's got two ways in which it prevents the oil from coming out of the end of the rear main. Now also, it is imperative that you do not take this out whatsoever. I think from memory, it's about a tooth out clearance and you do need specialty tools to be able to set it. If you get it wrong, you undo it, you think, ah, oh, she'll be right, bit of silicon, bang it back on there. Chances are very highly likely it is going to leak. So if you are ever to do this, if you ever take this off, you need to go seek professional advice and get it refitted. And generally it's gonna cost you about five or $600 to do it. Unless you know the specific method and anyone that does, please leave it in the comment section below or hit me up on Instagram and let me know because it would be worthwhile knowing. But moving forward from here, whatever you do, don't undo the rear main bolt caps at the end of the crankshaft close to the flywheel. All right, so just grab your half inch gun or your ratchet and take off all the bolts. Now these do have washers with them as well. So make sure they all come off as one. I'm actually hoping that this whole plate comes off around the back of the crankshaft. All right, so we've now loosened it. Just got to pull it off this dowel right at the top. And that plate will just come oh, straight off. All right, so you can see the old gasket in there. Just remove that, throw that in the bin. Put that one off to the side as well. So all these parts will probably end up getting uh, cleaned. So we might just run it in the kerosene bath or we might even get it um, bead blasted just to help clean it up a bit. All right, next part is we need to do two things. One, we need to remove the oil pump and two, we need to remove the Welsh plug. So we'll do that in a minute. We'll get on to doing the oil pump first. All right, standard three bolt design. Bit of British heritage here. It says uh, concentric Birmingham. So concentric type pump, probably made in Birmingham. I'm sure someone in the comment section can let me know if I'm right or if I'm completely wrong. Right, so it did take a little bit of persuasion to be able to get that off. Huh. I'm not entirely sure why that's all come apart. Maybe that's just how it is with this type of pump. All right, so that assembly, I imagine should, yeah, that will just come out. If I can uh, get it, that is. Just give it a bit of a jimmy in under there. Yeah, there we go. It's a very fascinating type setup of oil pump, that's for sure. A bit of swarf in there. A bit of debris, should I say. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. So it's even got a little locator tab as well. So that'll only go in, I'd say one particular way. So you can see the little dowel pin just there. That'll just line up. If it doesn't line up, then the bolts won't go in. 
There you go. Out she comes. That's all the sludge and crap that's in the engine. So this engine's probably gonna get hot washed or even in an acid bath to remove everything that's in there. So can't wait for that to happen. I still need to decide what color I'm gonna paint this as well. All right, next thing, we're gonna flip the engine over. So we're just gonna invert it. That way we can pull the crankshaft out. I'll probably not even remove the crankshaft, I guess just pull the pistons out from underneath. So this is where a engine stand comes in handy and certainly investing not only an engine stand, but also one of these tools just here. You can see it in the video listed above as well from when I did it for Mini Sport. So looks like there's half inch bolts all around the outside. We're just gonna go around and remove all those, then remove the sump and then work on getting all the internals out. So it's also noted that it does have a bit of an oval washer and they go on the ends. So towards the front crank pulley as well as the back of the engine, so towards the flywheel. And there's only two on each corner, I guess. Everything else just has a standard round flat washer or a spring washer. Oh, sorry, both. Uh, spring and a flat. And it just surprised me once again, that's got um, a little overwood washer here as well. Oh, so does this one. Anyway, go back and rewatch the video if we get stuck. So pretty much all those washers are on this side of the engine. So on the side where the push rod covers are. And it's worth well noting as well that only one, so uh, sorry, two so far didn't have that oval washer on there. All right, so we got them all out now. We should be able to separate the sump. So you can get special tools to remove a sump. I generally just use a dead blow hammer. Give it a couple of hits. Oh, and out comes the speedo drive for the distributor. All right, pretty much ready to come straight off. Looks like it's got an old cork style gasket on the bottom of it. Oh, yeah, some sort of fiber gasket, I guess. Now looking inside the sump gives a good indication as to what it's been like and how it's been maintained. There are oh, some pieces of metal. That's not looking good. I really don't know what that is. Looks like a bit of metal. I'm pretty sure it's metallic anyway. So there's a bit there. Let's just stick that off to the side. There's another piece, oh my gosh, down in here. Looks like a bearing actually. I'm sure someone in the comments can just let me know their thoughts. A little bit on this side as well. So that might actually be half the reason why it's got end float. Yeah, look at all that. So it's probably got too much end float because the bearing started to let go. So hopefully we can use the crank. If not, Colin's gonna have to get us another block and or crankshaft. So it's really important as well that when you find that sort of stuff, you note it down. And if you're unsure what it is, speak to a professional. That way you can get it addressed accordingly. Last thing you wanna be doing is reassembling an engine like this and thinking, ah, she'll be right and not really knowing what you're doing. And then before you know it, See you later, engine's cooked. Now, I just went to reposition the camera and just found this. Not entirely sure what that's off. Let's give it a bit of a clean, very flat edge. Yeah, so end float is certainly, if you've got this much end float in your engine, there's probably something wrong, just saying. I'm no professional, but, but this is Cactus. Uh, in actual fact, I am professional. I'm a professional artist, to be honest. Professional bullshit artist. <laughs> but in all seriousness, when you find stuff like this, you really need to find out where exactly it came from. So the fact that we are gonna be removing the oil pickup um, and the con rods as well, we really need to be looking into it to find out exactly where this thing has come from. All right, next is gonna be the oil pickup, or the oil strainer, should I say. So there's just two bolts, one on either side. Make sure you take the washers with them as well. So by the look of this steel tube, just down here, so this one here, uh, it's probably the drain back for the rear main oil catcher assembly, which is this bit here. So as I said, 
Once we take this out, you should be able to see there's a little flat surface on the back side of here that'll deflect it. And then inside here, there's also a corkscrew type uh, set up on the end of the crankshaft which throws the oil back inside the engine. If it gets past there then you've got bigger fish to fry rather than just having oil going past there. It's probably not sealing somewhere so yeah definitely do not remove this whatsoever. Alright so in order for us to get this off we do need to remove the oil pickup pipe from the block. Alright we're just grabbing a 15 16 spanner. I'm just going to loosen that. Hopefully it's not uh -huh. wasn't that tight thank goodness. So once it's loose enough by hand, you should just be able to undo it. Stick that one off to the side as well. Probably fine as well. That's got an O-ring up inside here somewhere. Or it might just be a tapered fitting. Um, oh no, there's an O-ring inside there as well. Yeah, you've got to make sure that O-ring is fitted inside here. Otherwise, you're going to lose oil pressure because it's not going to pick it up. Therefore, you're going to seize your engine in a matter of minutes. All right, so like I've shown you guys on many, many episodes before, in when you are removing con rods, pistons, whichever part of the engine you're removing from the bottom end, what you wanna be doing is a couple of different things. Firstly, we're gonna be marking which cylinders are which cylinders, meaning this is gonna be number one, number two, number three, number four. Now, like I've explained on several videos before, when you are removing con rods from a block, you need to make sure that you not only number them, but you also marry them up to the right con rod caps, meaning that they are pressed cracked on each one. So it is put under a certain amount of stress, which then causes a fracture, which then it'll only go one particular way on one con rod. None of them are exactly the same. So what I like to do is number not only one, two, three, and four, or however many cylinders there are, denoting that number one is always closest to the front of the engine, so the front crankshaft pulley. Not only number each one of the conrods, but also put a line there as well, so you know which way it went. I do mine exactly the same every single time, that way I never get confused with which way it goes back together. So, what I'm going to do here is, I'm just going to grab my texter, I'm just going to rag, I'm going to put lines down it, that way we know which way it goes. And we're gonna do the lines in the same place on the same side on every single conrod. So I'm just gonna put a line at the back on each one of them. That way I know that we don't just happen to be changing the direction of any of the conrod end caps on either side. Now also, like I was saying, we also need to number them. So what I like to do is just do a dot on each one. So as you go, put more dots. So next thing is, we now need to remove the conrod cap bolts. So like I've mentioned before on many episodes, it's worthwhile noting as well that you need to have different tools for different applications. In this case, I'm using a longer 3.8 handled ratchet to be able to undo these rather than my shorter ratchet. It's not necessity, but it is worthwhile having an array of different tools depending on the applications that you're doing. So now they're all loose, I'm just going to grab my 3.8 gun to sweep those bolts out. Now we're going to take one out at a time, that way we can marry up the end caps and the bolts with where they came from. So take the cap off, it's got the bearing inside there, it doesn't look too bad. A little bit of score marks, the hardening started to come off, put that to the side. And then you can just push the piston down gently with your hand. Oop, there we go, see you later. The piston doesn't look too bad. It's got a groove in the, the side of it. Not entirely sure what um what that's for. Bit of spring tension left on the, the piston rings. That's a good sign. All right, let's move that to the side and move on to the other three. All right, so that's pretty much everything out. Um, I'm going to leave all the end caps on there just because I know that if I was to remove it, uh, chances are I'd probably damage it trying to get that end out. And like I said, we don't want to be removing the end bolts at the end here where my finger is, which you probably can't see. Uh, but you definitely don't want to be removing where this drain pipe is, where it's attached to. So I'm going to leave that in there. If they need a tunnel bore it, they can. I did notice one very uh, different thing, I guess. 
uh, where the camshaft actually runs inside the block. It's got one cam bearing at the front of the engine, so at the harmonic balancer side, but all the way through, I can't see any other cam bearings that sit in there. So it's really interesting to see that it must just run on a film of oil, or maybe it's let go, maybe it doesn't have them, maybe it doesn't have it to begin with. So anyone in the comments, please let me know what the go is with this. So we've got all the pistons out, all the con rods are back together. I'm not gonna pull the gudgeon pins out, I'm gonna leave it assembled. If I need to do that when I go down there with Colin, I can do that then. Um, as for the end float, that is very, very excessive. Um, I haven't yet found where that bit of metal came from that was sitting here when I pulled the sump off, so hopefully it's just part of something that I've missed or maybe something that's fallen inside the engine. But like I said, the question is where did it come from and what is it off? This sort of thing is you don't wanna be putting back together and thinking, ah, it should be right. Not knowing that it's a vital component inside the engine that's let go. And then before you know it, the engine's absolutely just imploded on itself. You've caused cataclysmic damage and there's nothing you do to rectify the block. So like I said, if you're ever unsure, go seek professional advice. So next episode, we're gonna jump onto the cylinder head. I'm gonna show you how to remove um, valves, stems, and collets um, off the top of the head. We're then going to take it down to Colin at Sprite Parts, get him to get all the parts we need, and then, yeah, discuss the options that we have in regards to the modifications to this engine. Like I said, I would do want to run a vernier-style timing chain on this. I might even upgrade uh, not only the pistons and the camshaft, but also the rockers as well. I'd probably get the high lift, 1.5 to one, it would probably be the best option, and any other mods that I can do. If I can do a light and flywheel at the back of the engine, it's gonna help the engine rev it's significantly better and faster as well and it's going to be a lot smoother so i've actually been speaking to my mate in the uk paul jeffries and he suggested that balancing the harmonic balancer the crankshaft and the flywheel all at once makes a hell of a difference the entire engine is nice and smooth it reciprocates uh, faster it's better it's just all around a much better option to be able to do so i've never really been a fan of it i've never really known exactly what it is i kind of thought it was a bit of garbage to be honest but the more i speak to him the more i find out about these engines so it might even be worthwhile doing that as well well that's pretty much it for this episode next one we're going to jump onto the cylinder head and move on through into removing all the valves the guides and the stem seals anything we can remove from the cylinder head before we send it away for machining anyway guys like always stay covid safe i want to see you right here on another episode of tomo's tune-ups